I'm still down with a cold, so I've made you a new video instead of doing anything practical. First of all, let me say thank you very much to all who commented on the last video. I'm very lucky that so many smart people watch this channel and I learn a huge amount from you lot. You pushed me to look up torque converters and viscous heaters and induction heaters and cavitation boilers and things like that. Very interesting. Mind you, many people tried to push me towards generating electricity first and then converting that to heat. In fact, some people even recommended PV panels. Now, come on. We're talking windmills here, people. Proper windmills. Yes, of course, you can generate electricity with them and use that to heat water. But you do know how much energy is lost every time you change from one form to another, don't you? Lots is the answer. Lots, and that's metric lots as well as imperial lots. Not that I'd normally be that fussed about efficiency and energy losses. After all, the wind is free. But as I described in the first video, we are limited here in what we can build. There won't be a lot of spare energy, so I can't afford to waste it. That doesn't mean I wouldn't like the option to hook up a generator too, but I wanted to look at the most efficient way to heat water from the wind, and that is probably using the kinetic energy directly. Lots of people suggested I avoid the steel on steel thing because of the wear on the plates, which is obviously sensible. And they pointed out machines that already exist that create heat without actually touching things and no wear. But the point about all those is because they don't have metal on metal friction, the frictions within the liquid or, with, or between the metal and the liquid or whatever, which means there's less of it, so they need higher speeds to achieve the same result much higher speeds. Instead of a few hundred RPM, we're talking a few thousand RPM. Now, my windmill, if I build it, might be spinning like this. Guess how many RPM this is? It's 20 RPM, more or less. Obviously, it's going to be hard to regulate that, um, but it seems to be a good average speed to aim for. 20 RPM. Lots of torque, but not much speed. Now, of course, you can gear that up. First, when you drive the wallower wheel on the vertical shaft, maybe that's four times smaller than the brake wheel. So we're up to 80 RPM, but we've lost some energy in that gear change. Then we might have a, a large pulley wheel at the bottom of the shaft and use a belt to drive a much smaller pulley. Perhaps that big pulley could be five times bigger than the small one. So now that small shaft might be spinning at 400 RPM. But again, we've lost energy in that gear change. But perhaps that's a reasonable and acceptable compromise. We've lost torque, but gained speed, and we've lost maybe 20 or 30 percent of the available energy already in doing that that's just a guess it depends on the actual cogs and the belts and the bearings and things at this point we have choices we could keep gearing up that 400 rpm till we get to speeds that might work in a tesla turbine or a torque converter or a cavitation turbine or marvelous machines by the way but we would lose more and more energy in the process. We might well find that we could get something to spin at 10,000 RPM, but we could stop it with our hand. So it wouldn't actually do any work. Or we could do what I suggested in the first place, increase the friction load by using metal on metal. So we attain the same amount of friction, but at much lower speeds. That's why I set the pillar drill at 400 RPM and put metal on metal, okay? <laughs> now, I don't know which is best, very fast with less friction or not so fast with more friction, but certainly slower is simpler. It's true the plates would wear out, but if it takes weeks to do that, then it's not really a problem, is it? See them as consumables. By the way, what you saw in the video was mostly the scale wearing off the plates, not the steel itself. In fact, 
Following a smart and simple suggestion, I set out to see how fast the plates are actually wearing by weighing them before and after a set time. I couldn't run this experiment for very long because after 20 minutes, the wooden upright in the pot started falling apart. So I had to stop it, thinking that 20 minutes might give me some sort of data from which to extrapolate. But something went wrong somewhere because the plates actually seemed to gain weight. <laughs> Gone up. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Don't worry, I'm not counting this as evidence of anything, except um, cheap scales, maybe. And a few of you missed my comment in the video about a heat exchanger. Well, of course you would need one of those so the dirty water around the plates doesn't go into the heat storage space or into the radiators or whatever. A couple of people even thought I was going to drink it like that. Really? <laughs> Is that how you make your tea? No, thanks. And people were worried that there would be a nasty metallic sludge but as a couple of people suggested, perhaps all you'd need is a magnet in the corner to collect any scrapings. As for rust, well, I imagine there would be very little oxygen in the water after a couple of hours. So I don't think that rust would actually be a problem at all. I could be wrong. And of course, putting all the mechanism inside an insulated box should make it possible to collect almost all the available energy. So that part of the setup is potentially extremely efficient. So to sum up friction heating, yes, you can have less contact and save on wear, but then you need much higher speeds and you will use up energy just to get up to those speeds. Now, the other excellent suggestion from lots of you was a heat pump and all the variations around that. Even the simplest are a lot more complicated than my few lumps of steel in a pot. And some are very complicated indeed. The essence of them is simple enough. You compress a gas into a small space and then release it into a bigger space. And repeat. The same gas goes round and round in a circuit. As the gas expands, it collects heat from its surroundings. And as it's compressed, it releases that heat again. So if you separate the expansion side from the compression side, you can collect heat from one place and move it to the other, just like a fridge, but in reverse. For a heat pump, you need a compressor and a gas tight circuit with valves and an easy way for the heat to get into and out of the gas. So those containers are actually long tubes, often with fins. And if you collect the heat from the air, you'd want a fan. And if you're collecting it from underground or underwater, then you'll need a pump. All doable, absolutely. You could directly power the compressor from the windmill, but you'd still need the pump or the fan. By the way, people are telling me that heat pumps can be 400% efficient, which obviously isn't exactly right. A heat pump isn't generating any heat, it's just collecting it, and it can collect more heat energy than it uses, so that's why it appears to be so effective. I like it though, and I will look into heat pumps. And then there are induction heaters. <laughs> Brilliant things. If you spin a ring of magnets close to a metal plate, that plate will get hot. I love it. <laughs> but again, those things work best at high speeds. And the only way to test how well they would work in this particular context with the slow moving windmill is to build one. And that means buying lots and lots of magnets and the bigger the better and the more of them the better. So I'll have to park that for now. And this, anyone out there has a few hundred big neodymium magnets they're not using. And Goose sent me a link to a review of some of the developments in mechanical heating, which is really worth looking at if you're interested. So I'll put a link to that in the description. Thank you, Goose. Anyway, I thought I'd just explain better what I was trying to do in the first video, 
and show you some of what I have learned since. It's all so interesting, isn't it?